and all things cloud native, supply chain security and DevOps. So CloudSmith is your cloud native universal artifact management platform. We support all your formats from your C sharp nougats to your Python wheels to your Rust crates and even your C++ Conan packages. We want them all. <laughs> so today our webinar, we're going to talk about memory safety. Did you know that you could completely eliminate software vulnerabilities by caused by memory corruption by moving your software from C and C++ to memory safe languages? The USA's NSA um, National Security Agency has urged developers to shift to memory safe languages like your C sharps, your Go, Java, Ruby, and of course Rust. And we're going to be talking a bit about, more about Rust today. So today we uh, we have a wonderful guest, Carol Nichols. She's a developer, the owner, the founder of Integer Thirty Two, and she's also the co-author of the book The Rust Programming Language, which is sort of renowned in in Rust circles. So I'm going to bring her on now. Hi. Hi, Carol. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for coming on the show. We want to hear all about these terrible <laughs> vulnerabilities. And, and what Thank you so do. much for having me. <laughs> yeah. So how did you get into Rust initially? You weren't always a Rust. <laughs> no, I wasn't. So I was a Ruby on Rails developer for a long time and I was working on a Rails app and doing a lot of performance tuning. And there's a certain point at which if you want to keep tuning Ruby, you have to drop into C. And I am terrified of C. I had a, a couple of college courses in C and I was lost most of the time and was at office hours all the time and didn't understand it and I hated like you make a mistake and you just get a core dump and it's like good luck yeah oh, i love those compiler messages they're they're so useful yeah yeah so i knew that i should be nowhere near production c and coincidentally that was around the time that rust was gaining some publicity it was before 1.0 of rust and a colleague of mine had written an ebook called rust for rubius and i said oh i That's can you. do that and it was really exciting to get involved in. And I sent him so many pull requests to his book that he, this is Steve Kladnick. Uh, he eventually brought me on as co-author of the Rust programming language. It has the Rust for Rubyus kind of evolved into the official book, which evolved into the print book, the Rust programming language. And, and I just love it. I, it, it, feels like the compiler is taking care of the boring, tedious, important memory management parts of programming at a lower level so that I can concentrate on the actual business problem I'm trying to solve and know that I'm, I'm able to write faster code than I could in Ruby. Like and all those yeah, boring, dangerous problems. They're like the worst. Yes. Yeah. So it feels like I can like offload that to the Rust compiler, which gives great error messages as opposed to C. And I, it feels really empowering. I feel like it ex has expanded my abilities because it, it is like a productivity booster, a, an ability booster sort of thing. Yeah, so let's start at the start. Like what why is C and C++ why are those so prone to vulnerabilities? Yeah, so C and C++ don't well, let's let's go go with C to start with. C gives you very little in the way of keeping track of what memory is valid and what memory isn't valid. So the, the big problems that are very, very common in C are use after free, where you have a pointer and then you've called to some allocated memory, you've called free on it to clean it up, but something else also has a pointer to that memory and tries to use it. And if an attacker is able to put a malicious code at that location instead, then when you try to read it and it's actually invalid, C just goes ahead and reads it and and keeps going. And that's how a lot of remote code execution vulnerabilities happen. Double free is if you call free on 
on the same memory location twice, and that can also cause corruption. Buffer overflows, underflows, overwrites, overreads. Yeah, um, a lot of them are to do with buffer overflows, aren't they? Mm -hmm. It's when like you have you... like a list of stuff and and C lets you go right off the end and just keep reading whatever is over there. It trusts and us too doesn't much. Stop you. <laughs> yeah. These are things that C just lets you do, and you just have to be careful. And yeah. especially when you're doing multi-threaded stuff, it doesn't it doesn't help you at all. And some people say, oh, well, you just have to be careful. You have to be really smart. You have to, I'm, I'm very careful. I'm very smart. No, there's been two independent studies by Microsoft and by Google, the Google Chrome team, looking at the security vulnerabilities they have had in Chrome for, from Google and in all products from Microsoft that they have had to issue security patches for. And they've analyzed the root cause of these issues. And about 70% of them were due, the underlying cause was a memory safety problem. So that's, um, uh, that's most of them from my calculations. <laughs> right. So like we, we as an industry are not capable of being careful enough to avoid these, like the big companies have shown this. This is not possible. Yeah, if Microsoft and Google are having 70% of vulnerabilities from their big products are down to these memory issues, then nobody exactly. can handle them effectively. So there's a, there's, but there's a lot of C and C++ code out there. But if you were to move, like where I suppose you would think that Rust would be the obvious successor, right? I presume. Yes, I am definitely biased. I think Rust is the best option. And we can get into why. Google also has Go, which aims, kind of aims to get the simplicity of C. There's Zig, which is not a memory safe language, but is also trying to be low level like C. So mm -hmm. there are cases where that might be appropriate. D is another kind of successor to C, but it's a little more niche. Nim, I've also heard of as having supporters. And Swift. Oh, Swift for Apple. I, and like mm -hmm. for a lot of these, for a lot of cases, you could probably use maybe what people might consider um, languages with this, like a less steep learning curve. Yeah. Like you could use C Sharp, you could use um, Java, you could use these memory safe languages. But we're talking about languages that need the performance of C and C++. Really, you can't just you can't just go to those languages. You need something that has the performance of C++, but with this added memory safe feature. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So like if, if the overhead of a garbage collector is acceptable and Go does have a garbage collector, then like that, those languages are a great choice, but there are cases where you need more performance than that, or you're in a resource constrained environment, like an embedded device. So you need to have a way to manage memory without the runtime overhead of a garbage collector. And Rust is great at that. Rust is not as, as portable as C. Like there, you have to be able to compile to the target you're trying to get to. And not every embedded device supports Rust or Rust doesn't support every embedded device yet, but that's the end goal. Whenever I think of memory safety, I think garbage collector, but Rust doesn't do that at all. What, no, what, maybe no. just to like quickly, could you explain how how it actually manages memory this way? Absolutely. So the big part of the Rust compiler that does this is called the borrow checker. So Rust, the compiler looks at your code, and where you introduce a variable that allocates memory, or even on the stack, where you say let x equals something. It says, okay, we're, we're at, that's the start of memory allocation. And then it looks at all the uses of that and sees that. So that X is the owner of that memory. It sees okay. when that owner goes out of scope. And when it Rust compiles your code, it inserts what's called drop, which is essentially the free when your code no, is no longer using that variable when when the owner goes out of scope. So it's doing the ALK and the free. It's putting them in the right spots for you. You don't have to remember to do that. And any place that you want to let your code read or write or borrow is what we call 
take a reference to that memory. Like you can pass references to that to other parts of the code. And the borrow checker makes sure, looks at your code, analyzes, and makes sure that those uses of the references aren't being held on to longer than the owner's scope. So you can't have use after free because the compiler will complain and won't even let you compile the code. So you're stopped at day one. Like there's no way you can release code that is that loses memory, like the way right. you see in C++ does. Brilliant. So you're shifting left as far as you can, which is brilliant. Yes. Yes. Now there, there are some exceptions. Is this the unsafe keyword? Exactly. Yes, yeah. Yes. So unsafe lets you opt out of a certain subset of Rust's guarantees. It lets you dereference a raw pointer, which is the big one. And it lets you interoperate with a C API with anything that else that talks C, the C ABI. So when you, you can use the unsafe keyword and say, Hey Russ, I'm going to check, I'm going to make sure this pointer is cool. So you let me use it even, even if you can't tell that it's fine. And the advantage of this is that it's opt out and, and you have the spot in your code that says unsafe. So if you do have to do this for things like interoperating with C or interacting with devices, which are inherently unsafe that Rust can't verify. Then if you limit your use of unsafe and you get a crash, then you know you have a limited number of places to look. I know Rust is in Linux. There's a new open SSL that's Rust specific. Yeah, um, Russell's. Russell's? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So when that's like, talking to other modules in Linux, that, that would be unsafe though. When it's talking to other C modules that then you'll use the unsafe keyword. Is that kind of how it works? Yes, because Rust can't verify anything that C is doing with whatever you're passing back and forth with C. So you have to say, this is unsafe. I will, I will check it myself. I was looking up the Stack Overflow developer survey this year, and 12% of professional developers that were surveyed say they're Rust developers. Only something like 16% are C and 20 are C++. Like there's still a lot of C and C++ yes. out there, but Rust is making its way up. It's also on the same survey. It was the most desired technology, which, so it is having a real moment. Do you think part of that is, is to do with the people involved at Rust, the ecosystem and like crates, Dio, there's a lot of packages there. And so there's a lot there for people. Why do you think it's becoming so popular? Oh, I think it's a lot of things. I think, I think there's some luck involved. I think we, Rust came on the scene at the right time. Rust actually doesn't, doesn't add a whole lot of new ideas. Like the borrow checker was an academic idea that's been around a lot longer than Rust has. And a lot of the package management, like Cargo is the package manager. And a lot of how Cargo works was inspired by Bundler and NPM, which is an another huge benefit over C and C++ that don't have a standard package manager and it's super hard to bring in libraries in, yes. in C and C++. Yeah, we talked about, I've looked into this recently because we released a feature like more stuff on Conan, which is a package manager for C++. But it's still a minority of C++ programmers that actually use Conan. It's mostly they drop in the DLLs or they use CMake to mm -hmm. sort of to hack it together. Not hack, I don't want to. <laughs> but you right, know, it's, it's all it's all ad hoc. There's not a standard. Every project has to invent it on its own. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that Rust came about where package management was more the thing to do, you didn't have yeah. to reinvent the wheel or like you, you weren't there before package management. You kind of had all these things are coming together at the right time, like you were saying. Right. Yeah. So, so we're learning from previous mistakes. We're bringing it all together in a way that is, is makes people more productive. Everyone is realizing that C and C++ are not working out and and like the compiler is just very supportive. It's, I don't know, it's, it's strange to kind of anthropomorphize the compiler, but people talk about, you know, fighting with the borrow checker and the compiler is kind of your pair programmer who's always right. And, <laughs> but like there, there has been a lot of human work put into the compiler. Esteban, I'm blanking on his last name. He's 
Esteban K on on GitHub. But he especially has put a whole lot of work into making the compiler errors useful and like it they pull in your code and say right here oh this thought needs That's... to do this and where possible it says have you tried maybe doing this other thing this might fix it so so it's fun watching people start to start to use rust and they're used to other languages where you know you get a screen of garbage when you get an error and they're like they like ignore it and start guessing at what the problem is i'm like no 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 go read the error message i promise these error messages are helpful like you have to change your habits and get used to going to read the error messages because people put a lot of work into making them better it's like um, you're, you're a compiler but also a little bit of a therapist you know yeah <laughs> yeah and like another another big thing that i think helps is graden hor it, it was his research project at mozilla and when he open sourced it he hit one of his conditions was it had to have a code of conduct as part of participating in in the rust community and which was kind of controversial at the time i feel like this it's slowly becoming less controversial it's slowly becoming yeah. oh yeah we should we should have a code of conduct but then we we have a moderation team i mean we can always use more people to help with the moderation team because it's a thankless job and but it's it's something that the rust community has always taken seriously which has been different from other communities i know i know linus torvalds has had kind of a change of heart in the past few years but he used to be famous for you know, just tearing into people for their code with abuse. And like, he kind of set the tone for the community and systems programming was not, not welcoming to people who were trying to learn. And Rust, like the, the tone that was set at the beginning was very different. And I think that has drawn in people who don't want to be yelled at all the time for trying to learn. So I think we've benefited and and gotten a lot of smart people who have been pushed out of other communities. And that has been a, a huge help, a huge driver of our success is that, I mean, Ruby, Ruby is famously trying to be, trying to optimize for developer happiness, which sometimes I feel like it goes a little too far <laughs> and is like, like prioritizes developer happiness over things like performance or, but it's, I feel like Rust is, is, Tr like trying to be helpful like yeah. we're not gonna we're not saying it's gonna be easy like systems programming is hard but we're gonna help you along the way the compiler is gonna help you as much as it can and we're all gonna make better code together yeah because um, one thing i found is well just personally just sometimes to move from like say you're a c or a c plus plus programmer to move to another language it, it is it's scary that 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 journey like you were you were king of the castle now you're back to square one it's nice to to be able to take up a language that recognizes that and doesn't treat you like dirt because you're <laughs> yeah because <Yeah. laughs> you don't know stuff so yeah I think it's a worthy it's it's worthy that this uh, that that ethos of being kind to people yeah and I mean, like, there's lots of, as I pointed out, there's lots of C and C++ code out there. It's There's going to be a lot out there for a long time. Billions, this is a big lines, problem. Yeah. And I am in favor of any, any way we can to help fix that problem. Like, there are many smart people working on making C and C++ safer, analyzing code at compile time and at runtime and sandboxing and static analysis and proofs and yeah and and, I think and other SF languages came, like yeah open sf came up with a new like a a framework for improving the safety of your c and c plus code like to do a compiler setting something like that yes which will eliminate a lot well a subset of vulnerabilities yes like we need to approach this from every angle we can yeah and, the one I like is is writing new code in Rust, and you, you can even do like incremental rewrites of C and C plus plus by using the the foreign function interface. You, I did a talk where I took a, a C library and ported it over function by function and had it compiling and passing tests at every commit and slowly moved it from C to Rust. It's possible, so you can start porting little pieces of your code, the the parts that 
are processing untrusted input, the parts that crash the most often, the parts that change the most often. You can start with that and, and start getting the benefits of it without needing to do a total rewrite because those take a long time, they're very risky yeah. and and you can't, you, you're spending time on that instead of new features. So so that's the that's the direction I like to take. Well, I the next support question I'm everyone ask you, yeah, the trying next question to do I'm, everything. The next, you kind of answered the next question I was gonna ask you is like, how would you approach moving a, a big code base to rust i suppose you you just answer that by bit by bit start with prioritize the the shakiest bits and move from there but i what do you think is the biggest hurdle for teams moving to a memory safe language so it it is different the programming there is a learning curve you mentioned the learning curve which we're trying all the time to uh, make that less steep to make new resources like you, the compiler will yell at you more. If you're coming from C and C++, the compiler will yell at you more for things you that C and C++ lets you do. And that will be weird. My partner actually was, was more of a C developer. And he, when he first started doing Rust, he, he said he would write code the way he always would in C and, and Rust would yell at him. And he would say, but I've been writing this code this way for years. Like, what? Why? And then, like, he learned more and understood more. And then he goes, Oh, I've been writing this code this way for years and it was wrong. <laughs> uh, so, so, like, it's kind of a, it's a shift. It's something different. And from, if you're coming from like a higher level language, like a Ruby or JavaScript, Rust is going to ask you to think about things you're not used to thinking about. Like, how much memory do you need? Are you, are you just reading this? Or are you going to write it? Are you, where are you sharing this with, like, are you done with this yet? Like strings, dealing with strings in Rust is a little more complicated than in other languages because of the memory management, because of the safety. Like you have to kind of think about some things up front that you may be not used to thinking about in other languages. But I, I'm of the opinion that this learning is worth it and I feel more productive I'm definitely more productive than I would be in C or C++. So once you get there, I think it's worth it. And we're working all the time to get more people to that point. Yeah, it's a journey, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I do you think that like I saw, I was watching a video on the AWS event and, and they their Q generative AI thing has like, they say that you can use it to upgrade from like Java 7 to Java million. I don't know what it is, the latest one. Do you think like at some point, like we can use AI to just be like, update this to Rust from C++? Do you, do you think, or at least maybe like a module or something, maybe start similarly how you would change a big code base, change something small. Do you think that we will get to the stage where AI will, will be accelerating our move away from those memory unsafe languages yeah i again like any tool that will help us do this i am in favor of there are existing tools predating this the big llm explosion here that will generate bindings to c and c plus plus for you there are tools that will attempt to translate c and c plus plus to rust they're not perfect they still need human review but they can give you a, a place to start from. And I'm sure I I haven't really spent too much time with AI tools myself. I've heard they're good at things like generating tests, which all like fuzzers are also great generating tests and, and poking at holes and figuring out ways that you like you could generate a bunch of fuzz fuzzing tests against your existing code base, port things over and then ensure that the code is still behaving the same so like that sort of tooling i think is super helpful and if llms can help people and and i've heard of people using llms to like explain code to them too which that could also be comment. helpful comments right. are great but a wrong comment is like yeah sets you off in the wrong direction right but then there's the question of is is the llm wrong oh no <laughs> yeah, like yeah i'm not I don't know. I'm a little skeptical of the We're whole LLM yet. thing. Yeah. Yeah. But but like if it's working for you, keep going with it. 
listener out there, more power to you. But yeah, it like that might be a learning resource to get into Rust is having an LLM explain it to you because uh, like oftentimes the best part, way to learn is if you have someone you can ask questions to and they can look at what you're doing and they can yes. they can ask you uh, and figure out what your mental model is and figure out where that's not quite matching up so but you know there's not everyone can have access to an experienced rust developer to ask questions to we try there's chat rooms and and stack overflow and things like that but if if an LLM is able to do that for you, that can that is a resource you should take advantage of. This is it. So, but thank you so much today, Carol. You've enlightened us on how Rust in particular can help you eliminate those memory vulnerabilities in C and C++. And I'd like to thank so much for coming and sharing your insights. And just to let people know, you can be contacted on Rust. I'll put a link to your book in the notes. I'd like to awesome. encourage listeners to explore memory safe languages, especially Rust for that secure, robust software development. So yeah. thanks so much today and see you next month.